Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor. Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it. Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Real estate experiment, what is happening y'all? Today, I welcome Camilla Jeffs in to the lab with us. Camilla, I was saying this, I'm so happy to have you here in the lab with us because uh, uh, part of the lab, as you know, is putting that white coat on and putting in together the ingredients to make the experiments happen. Experiment, fail, learn, repeat is what we do. So when we look at you, you're an embodiment of what an experimenter is because you have a very, very versed background. And I want to just first preface it by, we did our research, our team does our research. And first I'm going to preface by just naming things that you've done and then you're going to say yes or nay that is not true yes it is true and then i'm going to allow you to introduce yourself because i'm so curious to see how you introduce yourself in this day and age so i'm going to go random here so you were at one point a varsity soccer coach am i correct yes sir wow you were a lead teller at wells fargo hi yes i counted lots of money Wow, okay. Had my so you hands in a game. lot of money. Yep. Got a money game going on. You are a transaction coordinator as well. That's correct. Yes. For realtors. Mm -hmm. For realtors. Okay. We're putting the pieces together, y'all. Process improvement specialist. So I see you're a systems driven. Are we? Yes. Yeah, that is also true. <laughs> okay. Owner of Abundant Choice. I believe it's Choice Properties. Yes, that is also true. So that's real estate acquisitions. Yep. Etc. Music conservatory, like owner of Camilla's music conservatory. Is that how you say yep. conservatory? Conservatory. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right, another gonna, business. We're going to go deep into that in a second. I just, I'm trying to put <laughs> the pieces together for experiment nation here. And then obviously we have this beautiful sign if you're currently watching this right now if you're listening to this we have a steady streams investments owner and founder um currently and we're not going to leave this one out i think i have another one here um ooh, i had another one um, I, I, we took down some notes right before music specialist yes at an elementary for 400 students i taught 400 students music and then you got an mba in uh i believe it's global supply chain management uh, is that what it is is that a specialty no. my specialty okay, was actually human resources it was the emphasis that i had so organizational okay, design which is what you're doing right now as well on top of being a mother yes. of five that is also true. <laughs> you didn't say All anything right. that was wrong. I was I was excited to catch you. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm just OK. So first of all, Camilla, welcome to the lab. And if you and I are just I don't know, we meet at a meetup or we maybe meet at the airport. Airport's my favorite because I love to travel and just gets me excited. So we meet on the airplane. I say, hi, I'm Ruben. Hi, I'm Camilla. What do you say next? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know if I would really talk to you on an airplane. Maybe I would. I don't know. <laughs> right. Because you did tell us you're an introvert, which means that right. we're that much happier to have you on the show with us today because that's a huge step. So hopefully you would say hi back. But what would you say? Yes. Yes, I would. I would say hello, and I would probably lead with that. I'm a you know I'm a business person. That I you know I love business. I love building businesses. I'm an entrepreneur at heart, and I have spent my entire adulthood organizing, designing, and building multiple businesses in different industries but they all connect in some way. Yes, yes, yes. And we were talking about the importance of that. And hopefully, because I, th I guess there's two things, Camilla, and maybe you will agree or disagree with me. If it doesn't connect, hopefully the skill set was, you know, once level up. I had a gentleman who was uh, Alex Hermosi, which is a book that I, or a gentleman who's in our network, who's doing really well for himself. And he said, everything that you do, um, you have to go to the next level up. So maybe it's, I don't know, if you learn something with your hands, the next thing is managing it. Then after that, it's communicating it. Then after that, right? So if it doesn't connect, Experiment Nation, 
at least hopefully you're building towards like an, a ladder of ascension. And did you find that that's how you felt fell into your roles or was it just, Oh, I'm interested in this and I'm really good at it. Like, how do you tackle the next opportunity in your world, Camilla? So I would say that I never fell into a role. I was very intentional about the steps that I took in my life. And I think the other thing I would say on the airplane is that I love change. I love to change things up. I love to, you know, go and tackle a new opportunity. Uh, some people might call that ADD. I call that, you know, being excited about new things and learning them and, and adding them to my repertoire. Uh, that's a music word for you. <laughs> wow. Look at see, see, you're now you're throwing in with the vocabulary. It's all connecting. <laughs> It works. It yep. works. Yes. Yes. So, you know, as I, as I look back over my life, you know, I, most things that I did were, were very intentional about, about building businesses. And so, you know, started out, uh, you know, building, um, I think abundant choice properties was the first business that I built and that was all in real estate investing. So that was, you know, tackling single family homes, figuring out how to, a fix them, right? You talked about working with your hands. Well, I'm a tile person. I can tile. I, I, you know, I do all the tile work at our, in our properties, in our homes that we go and rehab. And, uh, and then, you know, those five kids, we've taught them all how to tile and sheetrock and lay flooring and do baseboards. And, you know, they are all right there. You're you're building your own team in-house. This is a strategic and intentional (laughs) motherhood exactly that's that's <laughs> why you it. like give birth to five kids anyway right so they can do work for you <laughs> listen you did say the word intentional when you opened up all right the, the, so you weren't right. kidding like from reverse engineering all the way back home so that's lovely by the way may i ask what's the age did, did you have them all like back to back is there a little gap there with the with your kids uh so i had all five of them in, in eight years so they are all very close. Oh, so they're close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. There's there's four of us. So that's that's you know, I don't that's a good number. I mean, you don't see that anymore as as much, which is good to see. I yeah. think my mother wanted to have five too. Um, so that's awesome. But yeah, that's okay. So that's interesting. So you're saying you started with your hands, you even got the you know, mm-hmm. kids involved, you got the family involved, which I love. I love family businesses now. Help me out here because I'm trying to just connect the dots. You started with Abundant Choice um, Properties, and that was single family, fix and flip, or what was that? Yeah, it was single family, fix and flip, or fix and hold. So we held most of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that was uh, we layered in a property management company. So, you know, launched that and ran ran that all all on my own. And then also layered in the... uh, you know, process improvement stuff and transaction coordinator for other realtors. And so if you, if you think about the, the layering, right. So we, we kind of learned the bot, the grunt skills first mm-hmm. by going in and, and doing a property. We actually lived in the, the first, you know, fix and flip that we did. We bought it owner occupied and lived in the construction mess and just, you know, really had messy hair all the time. <laughs> Um, but then, then layered on that property management. So you're learning landlord techniques. You're learning how to proper, how does property management work? How do you get a good tenant? What even makes a good tenant? How do you do marketing and advertising and, and, um, how do you manage wow. contractors or, you know, things like that. Um, and, and so layered that in and then layering in the re- transaction coordinator. Well, how does, real estate sales really work and how can I get more deep into finding deals and the acquisitions process and what's the you know what's the thought process behind sellers who put their house on the market as opposed to not putting their house on the market and and how do you navigate that and, and then how do you build a network with other with realtors if you want to do you know fix and flips and, and find realtors who can help you to to do that and so that was that was kind of all a progression in the real estate field. Now, everybody's going to think it's sidebar to do music, right? <laughs> like, what was that all about? Why would you build a music business? Um, and what does that even have to do with what I'm doing today? Um, I'm sure is a, is a question. So the so music, 
Um, so music is partly personal, partly personal for me because growing up, I was I was a musician. I studied piano for uh, oh gosh, ever since I was five. To, I studied piano for like eighteen years. Um, so I am a you know semi I say semi accomplished musician in, in my piano um, and and also voice. So studied piano and voice, and you know those five kids that I have it's really important to me that they also learn piano. So where's the connection and where's the connection between music with music and real estate? Do well, I get to guess? Guess. Yeah. Guess. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's make it fun here. Uh, so one of the things that I could say with instruments that I wish I played more of, cause I played more sports. I think I like what the recorder, come on. Uh, <laughs> like, Come yes. On. That yes. doesn't count. And <laughs> and and a little bit of piano, right? But I know the instruments work a different part of your brain. And that's fascinating. And I know a lot of business is mindset. A lot of it is, you know, working in different mediums. So I check mark there, but I'm curious, was it something to do with that? Was it something to do with with repetition, perhaps? Commitment? Am I getting so no, really okay. it was it was like we hauled the we hauled the you know a piano to every house that we rehabbed and we played while we rehabbed so we would have music you're no, kidding i'm just kidding oh my god that <laughs> was kidding. too good i was i was gonna say wait that's kind of genius i was gonna like throw that into like that that's what we're gonna do with our kids right yeah, oh. there you go no you know what? no I you're exactly right yeah, yeah it is it's commitment it's repetition it's working through something hard because when you're faced with a new piece of music doesn't matter how accomplished of a pianist you are you have a new piece of music i guarantee you're not going to play it perfect the first time you sit down and try and go mm -hmm. through it right you're going to come up against challenges you're going to come up against really hard you know riffs and how are you going to play those riffs and how are you going to play those arpeggios and things and and work through it and you have to slow down very slow and get that fingering right because there's no way you're going to be actually be able to play that piece if you don't have the correct fingering as a pianist and so when you translate that to what you're doing in business in business right you're going to be faced with a challenge which is why i love business is because you're faced with all these right. challenges right every every new challenge comes up every day well if you try to just barrel through the challenge your your end product will not be as beautiful as if you slowed down really understood what exactly are the steps i need to take what order are the steps maybe i need to like figure things out and talk to someone else and get and get uh get help right because that's what you do in, when you study piano you, you take your piece to your uh teacher your teacher says actually that fingering doesn't work as well as this fingering she changes it all up. It feels wonky in your brain because you're like, this is the way I was always playing it, but now I have to retrain my brain to play it different. And suddenly it works and it works way better than what you had done in the first place. And so teaches you the value of mentorship, teaches you the value of you know, slowing down and how to approach challenges and how to work through, really work through them instead of just gloss over them. And then you're right. There is a direct connection between how well your brain does mathematical functions and how much music that you have in your life, right? All those rhythms, those, you know, all the, um, just everything connects right there. And, and so that's, that's the connection for me. Oh, you're, you're literally, you're good at this thing. You're like bringing it all together without, so we were talking about this, like, yes, it's all about finding a connection. And even in your personal endeavors, you're finding a way to connect and add, um, a, a, I guess almost like a way of life and, and this, this, um, this, I'm trying to think of the word it's, it's practice or this, this, uh, momentum or this rhythm in your own life and for the sake of your kids as well. What I loved is that you talked about, uh, challenge, which I want to touch on, but before I do, cause this came to mind because you're an entrepreneur and you're starting a lot of businesses, I have, I have a name suggestion that I thought would be as, as you were talking, I'm like, Oh, your next idea, do it for me. What do you think of steady keys investing or steady keys management, steady keys? No, 
Ooh, tough ah, I like it. I like yeah. it. I, like I don't know. I know they get the the piano like. And then I can have maybe? a piano logo instead of a house you know with a stream. <laughs> maybe I'll have my team design one for you. And, and I love it just love for it. your next your next project because I know there's going to be something next for you when you decide you want to add always. a little extra vertical. <laughs> Uh, that would be nice. No, but I, I really like the uh, piano. First of all, piano or instruments, or for me, I can relate it to sports, uh, you know, because I've always had that discipline growing up. I, I played varsity until I was in college, like balancing classes and, and practice and, and other stuff. It, it allows you to just, um, you know, I highly recommend it. It's not just real estate. It's not just business. It's also putting things into your life that are going to create the nurture of of kind of the, the the mindset that it takes and the commitment level and etc. So I love that you mentioned that. Um, one thing that you touched on was challenge, which I love um, because you, as I was listening to you, it's it's literally the life of an entrepreneur. It's like okay, solving a problem, challenge, solving a problem, challenge, and it seems that your trajectory was okay. Challenge, business created from challenge challenge business created and i'm serious because i'm looking at it i'm like okay property management then you have the uh oh yeah the process improvement then you talked about and i don't know if you 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 realized that you said this but then you talked about finding deals and how understanding the sales process and working with realtors so for you it's like every time you're solving a problem you're or you're trying to solve your own problem you're like okay you solve it and then you create a business out of it <laughs> am i am i correct i mean that's awesome by the way yeah yeah i never thought of it that way but that's yeah pretty much what i've been doing i listen more than i talk on this show i promise <laughs> that's a very good connection good job <laughs> okay that's awesome so which which one do you think camilla uh is was the most challenging to grasp because okay you know what i'm gonna take a step back because one of the questions i had for you that i wanted to ask you is what you thought your genius was like what do you think you're really good at um i know you told me you're an entrepreneur etc but what do you think where do you where are you in your genius when you're working in business do you think so my genius is being able to work just outside my comfort zone in most everything that i do um, and so, you know, what does that even mean? Well, everybody has a comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. My genius is that I take myself, I intentionally put myself outside my comfort zone in every possible way that I can, right? You mentioned sport. So I was also an athlete, in, you know, growing up and then, you know, became a varsity soccer coach and, and played, I played soccer in a tournament in Amsterdam and, you know, so done all done that, but then, you know, I got to be an adult and I still played soccer, but I'm like, I need something else. I need something else more challenging. And, and, you know, family members got involved in doing like running five K's. I'm like, well, that's boring five K's. And so I went and ran some five K's like, okay, cool, whatever, but I need something else, right? Like this is just not enough. And so then I thought, Oh, triathlon, triathlon. That'd be cool. There's three events, you know, and then you can like go from one to the next to the next. So went outside comfort zone, took on triathlon during my triathlon experience. I was, I was like, you know, maybe I should do a big one. <laughs> I've never done anything giant like that before. So I did a half Ironman triathlon. Oh, no. You said you, the want, word. you want to talk about going out of your <laughs> physical comfort zone for sure. And just tackling you, can, like these. Can you put, put that into perspective? Because I don't think so. I'm an yes. athlete. I train every day. Like I feel pretty fit. I still think, okay, I, I don't ever put limiting beliefs because I'm beyond that. But I do think that's one of those things where like, I don't know, Camila, I got to really give it to you. Seriously. Oh, you can do it. No, you can do it. The swim, I, I don't think I'm able to do the swimming part. You can do it. <laughs> just practice, man. Right. Just takes practice. <laughs> It's, I just oh. don't want to slip that on. Like, I want to give you a credit because that's incredible. Like I, I do, like, I really tip my hat. I have a friend who she's done it and over like, I think twice. I'm like, I, I know I can lift more than her. I know I can probably beat her in a race, but like that whole stamina and endurance that she has. No, I, that that's a whole different. When you pack that, that is a true definition of like 
a marathon and for the long term, right? Like it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So I want to give you a kudos because I, I, I don't think people get enough credit when they say, oh, I did an Ironman. No, no, no. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, okay. So I, and I'm sorry, I, I think I cut you off there, but I just wanted to highlight that because that's just so amazing that you've been able to overcome those things. And it starts with here. Um, let me ask you, are you out of your comfort zone right now? Like being on the podcast? Like, is this like not, you don't, because you told me you're an introvert. Is this out of your comfort zone? Yeah. So, well, it was in the big, be- when I first started being a guest on podcasts, absolutely. Mm. Like the first podcast that I was ever a guest on man, I was so nervous. Like I was sweating and I didn't have a proper setup and I had to go inside my closet because remember I have five children and I didn't want their noise. I don't ha- didn't have a proper microphone. The guy asked me a question and as an introvert, it's, it's I like to think before I talk. So I like to know what to say and I didn't know what to say. And so there were so many times when like, I'm glad it wasn't on video because... <laughs> because he would ask me a question and I would try to answer it fast. And then at the end, I'd go <laughs> oh. this face, right? Like, uh, I don't know if that was a good answer or not. Yeah. I still, to this day, I've not listened to that podcast episode. I will not listen, but anyway, it, it's more comfortable now. Again, the practice thing, right? It's like I I'm good at forcing myself to practice uncomfortable things. So it becomes comfortable. Um, so no, I'm not out of my comfort zone. Maybe a little bit. Maybe a tech. Well, no, it, the reason I say that, I think it's really important to highlight to our listeners and, and our viewers how on the other side of what you really want is, I mean, there's going to be discomfort on the other. And then on the other side, you get to your desire and, and obstacles. And I, I know that's sometimes we we overlook that. Um, and it's, you know, I was just at a conference. I just came from two weeks ago. I was in Orlando and almost 90% of the public speakers are like, okay, I'm really nervous right now. And you're like, no way, come on. Like you're crushing it or you're about to crush it. Cause we know who you are, <laughs> your big name, but um, people have public speaking anxiety. Uh, but the cool thing is they still have a message to deliver and they do it so well and they do it anyway. So yeah. I just wanted to like salute you for that because I think that's, that's fascinating. <laughs> I love it. if you're if you're uh listening uh, there uh camilla give us the salute right back she's she's on a mission uh I, I gotta ask you is it uh do you think it's nurture or nature like how you you're able to um and and i gotta ask you this because you're a mother of five as well and you're doing things intentionally so in in the environment so is this is what you have nurture or nature do you think I think it's both. I don't think you, you can uh, differentiate. I mean, so Mm. your, your nature, right. Is, is where is who you are inside, you know? So each, we can talk my children, for example, all five children are different. They are Mm. different, right. They have different personalities. I'm one of 10 kids. So I'm very different from my siblings, but we all grew up in the same environment, right. With the same parents, with the same, you know, values being instilled in us and, and, and things like that. Um, but then, but, you know, nurture in my environment, the environment that I'm teaching at my children right now, it is very intentional. So I mean, them coming and working in, in our properties and, and learning rehab is not just so I can have an ex- free labor, right? It's not just free labor. Yeah, it we're is- just joking, guys. Don't get any ideas here. I mean, <laughs> partially joking here. So right, right, yeah. but let's get child, to the bottom of child it. Child labor is alive and well, and it's fine <laughs> in your own yeah, family. As long as you're feeding them. Um, <laughs> right. Um, but it's intentional to to help them learn the, learn the business, right? And then yeah. we talk about it. In fact, one of my teenage daughters, so I have 16 year old teenage dot twins. And, um, we were talking at the dinner table one night about investing and she just starts laughing and she's like, you know, mom, I don't think any other teenager talks about investing at the, t- <laughs> at the table. <laughs> I said, Good well, fear. that's the environment that you're in, uh, you know, but, but I don't know. I mean, that daughter is very, um, she loves, uh, medical science, right? So she has intentions of, of going into the medical field. Now, 
I'm, you know, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to support her because I, I, I think she should be an entrepreneur. No, I'm going to support her and whatever she wants to do. Uh, but at least she knows how to be an entrepreneur. At least she's seen her mother do it. She can be, the, she's been right there with me. She's helped me build p- pieces of my business. Um, and in several different ways, not just hands-on at the properties, like she's helped me with the online marketing things that I do. And, and so they learn lots of different aspects of it. Um, and, and in fact, they're going to help me, they're going to help learn how to manage a short-term rental that we just purchased. And so there's lots of different things that, that she will learn and do, but she'll probably become a doctor and then maybe add this on as a side thing if she wants to. Hmm. I love that. So that's really, so this is interesting because you, you identify as an entrepreneur and you, and, and you also have tons of ed- education in, in school and you also have a career. What's the definition of an entrepreneur for you? Because we talked about problem solving, et cetera, but I want to hear it from you. What's the definition of an entrepreneur for you? An entrepreneur is someone who um, is willing to have the courage to tackle things on their own without someone else telling them that they have to do it without, you know, taking, uh, you know, direction from other people, they see a problem and they're willing to go out and solve that problem. That's what I think an entrepreneur is. Mm. Okay. So going back to the problem again, um, you talked about your genius is being out of your comfort zone, uh, which is interesting because I haven't really heard someone you know, answer that. I, I thought you were going to go with, oh, well, Ruben, my communication or my ability to analyze or my ability, but you went straight to the to the core, which I'm really not surprised. Uh, but now that I'm listening and I'm thinking about all that you built, which one did you have the most challenges? You talk about doing things by yourself, not being told what to do. You're getting up every day. You're finding, you're knocking on the door. You're, you're, you're feeling some friction. And that was metaphorically speaking, when I say knocking on the door of, of that next challenge. Um, which one did you feel gave you the most friction when you're thinking about the process improvement, the, maybe the property management, the getting deals? The, which which one during that journey you feel was most challenging and why? Mm. So I think the one that was most challenging was was probably property management. And, and the reason why is because I was, um, I had a lot of fear around around it right so i had a lot of fear about finding the right tenants i had um, a lot of fear about following like anti-discrimination laws that so there was all these things that i didn't know about all these missteps i was taking in in my property management that i could have got sued for easily right like you know when you when you select a tenant you should select the first qualified tenant you should not collect you know 10 people's applications over 2 weeks and then choose the one you like you like the best right because oh. there there are definite discrimination issues in there right and so i had lots of missteps lots of mistakes um, and so it was, it was the most challenging because I was just, it was messy. It was really, really messy until I joined a, an association. So I joined a, the Utah apartment association. Cause that's where I was living at the time it was in the Salt, the Salt Lake city, Utah area. And that's where I had most of my properties. And once I joined them and I got plugged into their systems and processes and procedures and, you know, classes about how to do it right. And I joined the good landlord program. I got my gold star, you know, (laughs) and that really helped me to run my business a lot more efficiently. And that was a really big learning point for me because at the, in the beginning, all of the businesses that I had built, I had just used my own head. I'd used my own head in, oh, I think I should do it this way, or I think I should do it that way. I didn't seek out external knowledge and, and therefore was making a lot of mistakes in my business. And so I've since learned from that. I've learned that, you know, I really need to seek out some kind of external um, ways of doing things so I can, and, and not because I don't trust myself. It's because, you know, you can seek out five different ways and then pick the best one that suits you. And then you can move your business forward on that, but don't spend all this time just relying on 
only on your own brain because your only brain you, you don't know what you don't know right yeah. like case in point discrimination i didn't know what i didn't know um and so doing that helped that's so interesting because i i look at it as um it's funny that you said five different points of views and i think we could all learn from each other here that's why we have this platform you said five different uh you know areas um it's funny because what i've been going to recently is kind of really tapping into somebody who's exactly where you're at already and kind of focusing on that one person um and and i'd love to hear your take on this the reason i do that is because there are a lot of different ways to do things and that sometimes when you are listening to too many opinions or too many different ways to do it then you freeze because you have an over, you know, consumption of, of, of ways that do work. You just got to pick one. That's one thing I've figured out over time. It's, it's kind of like asking, Oh, what's the best business model? Okay. Yeah. One vehicle might be better, but if you stick to it and you do it and you execute it, it will work. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Are you still one to, or why do you specifically go for a lot more advice? Do you, are you trying to see things from a different angle uh, or maybe I should be more direct. Do you believe in having one mentor or do you believe in having many? Uh, so I believe in many. And the reason why is um, not necessarily because I, you know, for, for very specific lanes in my business, the reason why is because I believe in diverse perspectives and and I seek out diverse perspectives in everything that I do also. And some of that, so here's another layer of my background, right? Is that, you know, I got my MBA and I went into, um, and so I worked in corporate America and human resources as a, as a business partner, something that is very key in tech, right? So in tech, so if we're out building an app that, you know, all of America could use this app, but we only build it from one perspective. Like we only have one group of, you know, one ethnicity group, one, you know, all people, the same ethnicity, same background, same belief, same thought process. The app we build is not going to serve our customer. And so I think about that all the time when I'm building my own businesses is that I need diverse perspectives. So here's a concrete example in my music business. So I built a, a large piano studio and the piano studio had 45 students in it. And probably 40% of those students were boys, right? Well, you know, I'm a female and I had assistants and I had hired two assistants and they were both female, but I had a gap because I had all these little boys in my studio who were learning piano, but they did not see what it looked like for them it older. Right. And so I had, I had the problem that I was going to lose them. They would only be stay excited about piano for so long if they didn't see someone who represented them wow. actually accomplishing something bigger. So do you know what I did? I went and I hired a male assistant who was, you know, 10 years, their senior to inspire and motivate and help them go. Mm. And so that's what I think, you know, when, when you think about building businesses and so steady stream investments, for example, well, what, what kind of perspective does that build? So this, this business right now is all about um, teaching passive investors, how to get involved in a real estate group investment uh, and specifically in apartments. Well, all these investors are not the same as me. They don't think the same as me. They don't do the same things as me. You know, they don't have five children. <laughs> just, so, so how can I uh, have different perspectives and different lanes? What can we focus on? How can we just really round out the business so that all, that all viewpoints are relevant? And, and so that's why I think having, you know, seeking out multiple perspectives is really important. Um, but then, you know, when you, to your point of there's too many and you you get an analysis paralysis. Well, now who do I follow? What do I do? Really? That's, um, you know, I'm going to put that back on you. That's your own problem, right? So if you get stuck in analysis paralysis, wow. that's a problem that you have that yeah. you've got to solve. Right. And so you've got to, to really just kind of look inward and say, okay, you know, I'm consuming too much information. I'm getting stuck. How can I get unstuck? Let me ask you then, because um, I think this is a good, uh, I want to make sure we're serving our, our listeners and whoever's watching. Um, 
when you do get, let's say, four different perspectives, how do you align? How do you go back to making the decision on which one you want to double down? And once you have received that perspective, what is your kind of rule of thumb in your world? So, so how do I choose a perspective? So I think it's yeah. what's important for me is my end consumer. So in every business that I've built, who is my end consumer? In the property management business, my end consumer is my tenant, right? And so what type of tenant was I attracting? What type of property did I have? Was it high income, middle income, low income? The t- you know, pr- property I had was low income. So how do you tailor your business to low income? Um, what did what resources did they have access to? For example, if I came in and I said, hey, everybody has to pay me using Venmo. Well, what if they don't have a, a smartphone, right? Now, now you're already like putting a barrier between your end consumer and yourself. And so that's when I look at all the perspectives because I could go in and I could say, oh, there's four different people that, who are really successful at running property management and this person here swears by Venmo. This person here swears by, you know, having them tape the money on the door, right? Well, which perspective? So looking at all the perspectives, which perspective really suits my end customer? It serves your customer the best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I like that. Uh, always going back to the, I always going back to the end user on the tech mm-hmm. side because i have yeah, a tech background just so you hey, know hey i love yeah, it <laughs> yeah like it and tech fintech uh-huh. business analyst project product all that yeah so it always goes back to the requirements the mm-hmm. end user what are they experience on the front end on a user interface for exactly. sure and then on the marketing side uh for in our world which is very similar to customers clients tenants it goes back to who is your avatar uh, you know, and what are their pain points? Um, so love how you brought that full circle. I want to give you the opportunity to really share with us your what you're doing for other investors. I know I, I you're such a fascinating person that we went so deep into kind of like who you are. And but I know what you do is bigger than you. And, and, and I can tell by all that you're doing and, and the people that you're serving. Um, we're talking about steady stream investments. Uh, we've talked about a lot of different areas in business that you're involved in. Uh, it, when you look at like a pie chart, steady stream investments, is that like 40% right now, 50? Like, I'm just curious with all that's happening in your world. <laughs> uh, what does that look like for your portfolio? And and, and that's going to, my next question is going to be like, hey, who else, who are you impacting? Is it more on the multifamily? Are you helping people invest their money? Or are you still helping, you know, uh, with your fix and hold, like, what does it look like today in 2021 going into Q4? Yeah. So going into Q4, it's full steam ahead with steady stream investments. Um, I have, I made a big shift in my, in my business approach in, um, you know, three years ago to move to level up basically. So I, you know, I was doing the small multis and and single families and um, decided you know, that it was time to really go after the big dreams and and the big dreams were to get the apartments. And so can you um, you give some context for, um, I I don't mean to cut you off. I want to definitely get some context when you say a small multifamily, because I know that people have a lot of different perspective depending (laughs) on who you are. So what, what did that mean in your world? For in my world, that was four units and and less. So duplex, gotcha. triplex, fourplex. That's what, and that's, that's what that I mean was. That multi. was the portfolio you were, you were fixing mm-hmm. and holding those uh, investment yep. properties here and there. Excellent. Yep. And now. Yep. And now um, I am a general partner in over two hundred and fifty units Amazing. with another. 190 under contract. And so working in the large multifamily space, but also I have an assisted living project we're working on too. Um, and, and that's a really interesting space is, and that will be new construction, but steady stream investments is all about educating the first time passive investor, how to get involved and how to like diversify out of the stock market and get involved in a real estate investment to really grow your wealth. Um, And not only grow your wealth, Steady Stream is also about providing what I call the investing trifecta. So the types of returns that we give are 
a one financial, right? We definitely give financial returns and their strong returns for a passive investors. So it affects their lives. It impacts their lives and creates wealth for their family and for future generations. Two, we give social returns. Well, how do you give a social return? Well, every investment that we make and every you know apartment complex that we purchase, we make sure there's some kind of community or social or partnering with a nonprofit to provide um, some kind of social impact on that community. So we're building communities as we go. And then the third is environmental. So what kind of environmental impact can we make? So again, every investment that we make has some environmental element, whether that's installing low flow toilets and reducing the consumption of water or uh, putting in solar panels or you know, doing something to reduce our carbon footprint. And so we really try to strive to have purpose. We call it pur- purposeful investing or impact investing is another term for it. Um, and, and I just want to show people that investing your hard-earned money, you can get more than just a dollar back for what you do. Mm. Like if you invest it in specific investments and are intentional about it, then you can create way more impact than just simply yourself. Oh gosh, Camila, that's beautiful. (laughs) I love, I I didn't even know that. I I love how you put that together. It's, it's more, it's going a dollar further and you're getting more than just, you know, your dollar back. It's financial, social, and environmental. That's, that's fascinating. And that's great branding. I have to say. Um, And, and, and when I say that it's, you're walking the walking, talking the talk. And that, I mean that, most respectful way powerful it's not like you're putting it out there as a branding you're doing it which is very admirable um i gotta ask you that's uh that's a remarkable transition and i want to the reason i'm going back to you is i I truly believe that people do business with people and i do believe that you're a reflection of your business camila and i think um people will really uh appreciate you know doing business with you or being associated with you because they know who you are. Um, So I got to ask you that transition from small multifamily, how did you make that jump? And can you give us a little bit of context of how many units you had and, you know, how that transition happened? Did you keep them? Did you do a portfolio loan? Did you just asset based lending? Like what was that transition to, to, to be with, you know, the, the big leaguers, the, 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 the big apartments. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was an interesting transition because I, I had hit a ceiling with, with our uh, investing in, you know, the single families and small multis. And the ceiling for me was that up until, you know, up until a couple of years ago, when I decided to transition, I was doing everything myself. So using all my own money, all my own skills, all my own time, all my own effort. And it got, exhausting. It was, it was, it was exhausting to be running all of that and, you know, to be the one out mowing the lawns. And I, I, you know, I was tired. I was really tired and, um, but I didn't know where else to go. Like, well, how, how do you go from here to the next thing? And, you know, I'd heard about creative financing, but again, as an introvert, that scared the you know, living daylights out of me. I like, how do I, how did you even do that? And, you know, or, or the go door knocking and find a great deal. Like, uh, no, I am not, <laughs> not door knocking anywhere. You know, you're <laughs> genius. You're like, that is not one of them. Nope. It, that is anti-genius. That. <laughs> um, so, so I was, I was stuck and I was stuck in my investing. Um, I wholeheartedly believed in real estate, but I also was, you know, at the point where the money that we were earning was not super great money either. We, we were right. building great equity, but each single family home was making like 200 bucks a month and I'm working right. my butt off for 200 bucks a month. And Absolutely. That, I'm like, mm. Yeah. And that's where I was going with that. What was that play, that bridge play that you made it, you know, did, was there a refi? We say what 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 was the first initial one? How did that look like? Just to give it some was context sell. For listeners. Yeah. So so basically, I sold all those single families and small multis, and we rolled that money into passive investing into large apartments, and and that's when I had kind of the light bulb moment that, wow, this is this is 
fantastic for one i don't have to do the work so as a passive investor you don't have to be the landlord you don't have to you know solve all those business challenges that come you don't have to worry about mowing the lawn or tenants or termites and toilets like all those things you don't have to worry about as a passive investor and the three T's, i was getting brother. like yeah no i was getting probably the same returns I mean, a couple of my single families did well and a couple didn't do well. So overall, average returns was about the same as a passive investor as what I was getting on all of my hard work. And I was so mad <laughs> that I didn't know about it earlier. Like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did so, you, yeah. <laughs> did you like it? First of all, that's such great context. And that's why we have this show just so maybe you can have that light bulb moment for someone else who's listening, who's doing the same just to get granular and tactical here for a second, did you liquidate, how many properties did you liquidate to, to, to come up with the amount that you needed? Uh, we liquidated three to come up with the amount that we needed. To. Okay. And then did you roll that into like a limited partnership a LP or were you a GP mm -hmm. right away? LP no, I was right an away? LP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is amazing because what you're saying is you're literally as a limited partner for our listeners, for those who don't know is, you know, a general partner is, you know, raising the money, finding a deal, running the numbers. And as an LP, depending on whether if it's accredited or non-accredited, whatever the structure is, you can come in as a limited partner, uh, put in your, your, your investment and let it grow as a whole collectively. And you just get yeah. your checks. Did I get that correct? Yes. Yeah. Mailbox money. It's the best. <laughs> That's crazy. So on three properties, you rolled that into, do you remember the size of that first apartment? It was 107 units was 107. how big the apartment how, complex was. How did you form that relationship with this uh, as an LP or, you know, just so, yeah. you know, we understand how, how it works? So as a, and when you're a passive investor, that's, that's one of the, the, the tricks is finding the right uh, group of investors who know what they're doing that will take care of your money. Right. And um, I'm not going to pretend I wasn't nervous because I was definitely nervous. Because remember, I've been doing everything all by myself this whole time. And now all of a sudden I'm going to join a group of investors. I mean, I remember group projects in high school and right. your girl here did all the work. Right. So, no, like, Camilla, no. Freeloaders. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm just going to partner up with Camilla. Uh, yeah, they totally could. And they knew it. And, and I was like, well, sure, whatever. <laughs> like, I need the grade. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so going in as a limited partner, that's one of the one of the challenges is finding a really strong team um, and making sure that they know what they're doing so that they're going to do well by by your money. Because it's we're not talking small chunks of money. We're talking, you know, 50, $100,000 at a time that you are investing into one of these um, uh, departments. It's not like a thousand bucks, right? So you're parting with that money and um, you want to make sure that the sponsor team knows exactly what they're doing. And I think one of the advantages that I have is that I've been in real estate so long that I talk it, I speak it, like I love it. <laughs> And, and I can really interview these sponsor teams and get to know them really well, which is one of the benefits that I provide with steady stream investments is that I, I will actually go out and I will, and I help passive investors learn, you know, and, and, and I interview each sponsor team that I, that I will allow to present to my passive investors, their opportunity and vet them and make sure that they are, that they are good at what they're doing. But yes, as a passive investor, you need to, that's the most important thing, right? The most important thing is to make sure that you are investing with people who know what they're doing and have very high integrity when it comes to money and, and will put your money first over themselves. Absolutely. And make sure that's structured in the deal. Definitely. Um, so putting the icing on the cake and bring everything full circle. You talked about you being a general partner where you're doing financial, social, and environmental returns for your investors. Now roles have reversed. Now you're the general partner as well. What was that transition like? And how did that first, how did that happen? Like how does one go from LP to GP? Was it from the previous relationship of that sponsorship? Was it, someone in your in your in your local neighborhood like how did you how do you put that together this whole gp did you go out on your own what how, what was the story there 
I went and knocked on someone's door and said, hey, he picked me. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> we know you too well by now. At this point, Jamila, we could, we could hear and see straight through you. That didn't happen. Tell us. What you okay, it did not happen. It was right? the goods. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I guess first, you know, investing as a as a limited partner or passive mm. investor really taught me a lot um, and helped me to understand a the perspective of a passive investor and what's important to them and what they what they need, um, and then b how to learn you know helped me to learn about active investing, the active investing side, as I watched the you know general partners on the deal that I was in and how they communicated us, how they were running their business, what could their financials look like, et cetera, because you get, you get updates on the properties. So that was one, that was my first entry step. And that's actually my advice to anyone who wants to be a general partner in large transactions to invest passively first, because you get you get in, you get your money working for you, and then you get to learn about this whole world. Next step for me was um, I loved it so much that I was like, wow, I really need to tell more people about this because if I had known about this type of investing mm-hmm. 10 years ago, I would have been in it 10 years ago and and probably in a much better spot today than, than I am now. Um, but I wanted to just tell as many people as possible about it. And so I was, I was super excited and just, and um, was trying to figure out how do you even join and become active? And so it was a lot of meetups. It was a lot of, you know, networking with other folks. It was a lot of trying to navigate and figure out the um, where we're going and, and who's doing what and, you know, educating like books and um, you know, watching videos and things like that. And that's how I really started doing it. And then I started watching the big, you know, the, the players in this space, watching how they do business, watching, you know, how they are navigating it. And, um, and then it just started, you know, networking them with them and meeting them. I did get a mentor um, and the mentor that I hired. So I hired a mentor in the space and I highly encourage people to hire mentors as well in, in large multifamily. Remember that piano teacher is going to be the one that's going to tell you, try this fingering instead. Um, so the mentor I hired was specifically in about capital raising. Cause I identified that that would probably be my superpower because I love to educate and teach and, and bring people along. Um, and, and that mentor has really made all the difference in my business and helped me to, you know, get to the point where I am today for sure. Got it. So when you first started the GP was by yourself with the help of a mentor, you didn't co GP or something like that. Somebody else. No, I, I co GP, right. So I came on as a co GP with a, with another sponsor team and helped and helped to raise capital and run and do some asset management because of my background in property Good. management. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's what I wanted to get to because I wanted to, that's a good stepping stone as well of being able to, to be a partner as a GP to kind of still be learning, but then also still be in the trenches. Yeah. Um, and where did you make that connection? If you don't mind uh, sharing that with us. Was that- so that, it was a door opened by my mentor. So my mentor helped to make the connection to my first, my first sponsorship team. Full circle. Love that because we brought it full circle because we talked about finding obstacles. We talked about operating out of your comfort zone, which is definitely that. And then we, we talked about, we briefly touched on mentoring and, and getting advice from people um, to kind of, you know, help you guide you into your blind spots, you know, and, and, and then we also talked about as an entrepreneur uh, being able to, to solve problems, add value and have that ascension, which is exactly what you've done. So it's really, really neat to see it come full circle and, and you uh, continuing to grow. That's, that's really neat. I, I, I love the story, Camilla. And I got to ask you, the last thing I want to ask you is, you know, you have a career, you know, you have a family, you, uh, how, how do you manage all of that? <laughs> it's a magic question. <laughs> Lots yeah. of people like to ask me that. Yeah. And you know, I always just, you know, come back with one day at a time. Right? I manage one day at a time. But really, um, I choose my life. I choose mm-hmm. what I spend my time on. And I choose, you know, when I work and how I work. And and so I think if you just if you just 
take responsibility that you own, you own your time, you own what you do um, and how you do it, then you prioritize and make time for the you know most important things in your life. And the, and the things that are not important just kind of fall away and, and it's okay, right? Like, it's okay to me that my house is not clean all the time, right? That, that doesn't bother me at all. It bothers a lot of people, but it doesn't bother me that much because I prefer to spend my time uh, you know, taking my kids to their tennis matches and and do you know doing things with my children outside of of work, um, and then also involving like involving my kids as much as possible in what I do um, helps helps everybody to you know, we kind of work together as a unit. It's not like mom's just you know over here doing her own thing except when she's on podcast interviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, next time we're going to have the family invited for sure. And, and I'm so glad yeah. you touched on that because <laughs> yesterday I was speaking with a gentleman and I don't have kids yet, but, um, you know, speaking with a gentleman and, and I was like, do you believe in balance? And I believe in integration. I don't, yeah. I don't think you need to balance if you integrate things in your life the way you should. And it was uh, very interesting. And I think I think you might be leaning towards balance, uh, uh, towards uh, integration as well, if I'm correct. Yeah, I don't believe it. I believe in unbalance. That's what I believe in. There you go. <laughs> I believe there are my language. times and seasons for, you know, for different things in, in your mm-hmm. life. And so you 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 spend a lot of time in, in one aspect at, when you're this old and the, like, right. Like when the kids are young, I spent a lot more time with them than I do when they're older, but the older, right now they're older, we do specific things and, and it's very quality time instead of quantity. And, you know, their life is never balanced. I have never felt like my life is balanced, but I haven't felt right. out of sync with myself because of that. Right. Like I'm not mm-hmm. out of sync when I'm unbalanced, I'm still like full on living and loving my life, even though it's unbalanced. Oh, Camilla, thank you for bringing it full circle. This was really fun. Um, you speaking of, I couldn't agree any more with you that, uh, there is no such thing as balance. Sorry guys. I mean, that's just me. That's how I feel. And Camille feels that way. And we're both in the lab. So that's what we're running with in our experiments. Um, (laughs) Camilla, you've given us so much of your time and value. You came in here, you're a warrior. You're, you put your white coat on, as we call it, in the lab, um, yeah, metaphorically, and you came on and you shared your experiments with us. We, we appreciate that. Now, I know we want to be able to connect with you. Uh, I know we have steadystreaminvestments.com, but I believe you also have a little special something. Something for us. You promised. You something. said. <laughs> you said yes, you got a little so- something. something. I do. I just created a a guide for introverts. So I there's, you know, I'm an introvert and I'm in real estate. And to some people that be like, that doesn't match. There's the whole balance thing, right? I'm out of balance, right? Like I'm not Mm -hmm. the, I'm not the typical real estate investor because I don't knock doors and I don't cold call. I, I don't do those things that, you know, frankly, give me such high anxiety that I just, you know, want to run away. Um, I'd, I do like force myself to do some things like go to networking mm-hmm. events because they're important, but, um, but there's a different way, right? There's a, there's a calm way to succeed in real estate. And so I created a guide for specifically for introverts that you can grab on my website and, and I'll send you the links for that. But um, it's a, it's, our introverts guide to investing in real estate and how to, how to have massive success as an introvert in a quiet way, but um, just really trying to build that brand and trying to navigate it. And no, I don't have a marketing background. I might, I took like two marketing classes in my MBA, <laughs> but marketing is super fun. It's been really fun to learn and to like grow in the space, yeah. but you know, I don't know. I might be interested in what you have um, to offer as well. And yeah, because things on my list to do next are, you know, maybe launch my own podcast, maybe do, uh, uh, you know, my YouTube channel, like like just to start really building. I just really want to dive in and build that brand and to see how, see how big I can grow this thing. My goodness. You're good at this branding thing. We might have to, I might have to dig in. There might be some marketing background that I missed. Very (laughs) well put together. Well, listen, we're going to have that in the show notes. If you're driving, as I always say, keep your hands on the wheel. It will be in the show notes. 
And uh, Camila, I can't thank you enough uh, for, uh, I think I did it again. Okay, so I struggle. I, I hope I haven't been mispronouncing your name because I do that sometimes, Camila. Sometimes I put stresses on names when there isn't a stress on the name. So Camilla, thank you for coming on the show with us and really sharing your story and sharing that piece of introvert. I love, this is why I have this show because there's so many different ways to do things. And the reason why we bring people uh, like you on this platform is to share that story to inspire someone else to do it the way you've done it. Because again, get different perspectives. See what we did there? I was listening. I was listening. Excellent. So, Thank you, Camilla. And just like that, we are out.